I had planned on doing the history of Britain today um, with the news that has come out about the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. I almost decided not to do it and to push it back to another day, but I decided I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it. I've been looking at some stuff since the news came out. She was born in 1926. Think about everything, everything that she lived through. The, you know, the stock market crash, the basically global depression that, that happens, the Second World War, the rise of a major communist country into and through the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the fall of the USSR, the wall coming down between East and West Berlin, then, you know, up through the, the modern day and the, the craziness that has happened, and even most recently with COVID. I mean, you know, we, we study and look at history as if it's these far off, you know, long lost times. And especially looking at something like, you know, World War I or, or around that time period, she was, she was born right after that, right after that. That is one person's lifetime. It's just, uh, I don't know, it, it gives a different sort of perspective to the things that we're looking at. But today we're going to do the history of Britain. Um, I'm not sure what direction they're going to go with this, where they're going to, you know, is it going to be all the way back to Rome or, are you know, is it the Vikings going to be in it? Are we going to talk about the, the different parts of Britain with Wessex and, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. So let's get into it and see what direction he goes. The United Kingdom is a nation located in the British Isles, made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Thousands of years ago, the Isles were inhabited by long-forgotten pre-Celtic people, known as the Beaker Culture, named for their distinctive pottery beakers. Little is known of them, but it has been suggested that these people laid the foundations for the mysterious Stonehenge a series of heavy standing stones which were transported from 150 miles away and arranged to form a calendar, marking the days of the summer and winter solstice. Over time, waves of Celtic-speaking people arrived from the European continent, who soon came to form the Britonic, Gaelic and Pictish people. These people were not a unified people, but were rather many tribes who shared a similar pagan religion, language and culture. The Romans invaded, conquering what's now England and Wales, but failed to conquer the Pictish tribes to the north. The Romans launched several campaigns into this land they called Caledonia. However, their fortifications were soon overrun and abandoned, and they retreated to Hadrian's Wall. Their conquered lands were incorporated into the Roman Empire, becoming the province of Britannia. They brought Roman customs and laws, improved infrastructure and connected many towns and cities with Roman roads. When the Romans left, there was a great migration of Germanic tribes. These were the Jutes, Angles and Saxons, with their language Old English. Their settlement pushed many Britons to areas in Wales, Brittany and a kingdom known as Dumnonia, while Scotland eventually evolved into four kingdoms. The smallest of these were the Scots, who were originally from Ireland, the Britons of Strathclyde, the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Bernicia, and the Picts of Alba. For unknown reasons, the Jutes disappeared from history, but the Angles and Saxons eventually formed seven kingdoms. Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia, Mercia, and Bernicia became Northumbria. After the collapse of Dumnonia, the remaining territory of Cornwall fought against the powerful Kingdom of Wessex. Cornwall eventually fell under the control of Wessex, but it managed to keep its own culture. Wales at this point was also made up of several separate kingdoms, the largest being Gwynedd in the north, Powys in the east, and Dufford to the south. 
The British Isles soon saw numerous Norse raiders from Scandinavia. These were the Vikings, and they began settlement on many of the Scottish Isles, the Isle of Man, and they even founded the city of Dublin in Ireland. The Scots and the Picts then decided to unite under Kenneth MacAlpine to form the Kingdom of Alba. The Kingdom of Alba grew strong over the years, and eventually Strathclyde was brought into the fold. Meanwhile, Danish Vikings arrived in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms for conquest. After fighting the King of Wessex, Alfred the Great, the Dane Law was formed, a land where the laws of the Danes held influence over the Anglo-Saxons, controlling the region and its affairs. The Anglo-Saxons eventually defeated the last Viking King of York, Eric Bloodaxe, and Athelstan became the first King of the English. Although, the newly formed Kingdom of Denmark would conquer England and even found a short-lived Danish dynasty under Canute. The Norsemen had a dramatic impact on the Isles, so it's no wonder some words in the English language have Norse origin. After defeating for- Yeah, and that's a super, super interesting stint of history to me, the Viking Ages. They just have such an impact on so many different places. I've talked about this on other videos, but I have studied and looked at the Rus forever, um, or who is referred to as the Rus historically, and you know, the Kievan Rus and all that. Uh, and it wasn't until somewhat recently on, you know, reading something or listening to something on the channel that I realized that there's actually an argument between historian, historians on whether the Rus were actually, you know, Slavs or whether they were Scandinavian Vikings who, you know, there are descriptions given of quote unquote Rus that sound an awful lot like Vikings. However, there's some argument of, you know, whether it was intermixing or whether there was, you know, Viking trade posts in which mostly Slavs lived and stuff like that. So there's arguments about whether or not that reference is actually to Vikings. However, um, they just have an impact on so much on the in this really influential age of you know creating the the states, creating the provinces and areas that are going to play a big role coming up in the future formidable sea raiders from Ireland, the Western Isles, Scandinavia and Anglo-Saxon forces from Mercia, Griffith ap Llywelyn subdued his rivals in southwest Wales. Llywelyn became the only Welsh king ever to rule over the entire territory of Wales. Wow. He was defeated by the English Earl Harold Godwinson and killed by his own men, leading to the Welsh kingdoms splitting apart once more. At the death of Edward the Confessor, there was a succession dispute between four claimants. Harold Godwinson was elected as king, and managed to defend England from an invasion by the Norwegian king Harold Hardrada. However, Harold had to march his army south to defend against Duke William of Normandy, who had crossed the English Channel. According to tradition, at the Battle of Hastings, Harold was killed by an arrow to the eye, and the Norman invaders were victorious. The new King William defeated a number of rebellions, built a new design of castles called Moton Baileys, and introduced a number of reforms, like If you have a historical nickname like quote unquote the Conqueror, chances are you were you were an animal. Trial by combat and the Doomsday Book. The Norman dynasty invaded into South Wales and parts of Ireland, creating the Lordship of Ireland. At court, nobles spoke and conducted sessions in the Anglo-Norman language, which endured for centuries and left an incredible mark in development of modern English. After a brief civil war, Henry II would marry Eleanor of Aquitaine, establishing the Angevin Empire, beginning a long rivalry against France. Richard the Lionheart defended much of this territory, and also became a central Christian commander during the Third Crusade achieving considerable victories against his Muslim counterpart, Saladin. Under King John, heavy taxes were imposed on his barons in order to pay for his expensive foreign wars. The barons rebelled and forced John to sign the Magna Carta, a charter that established the principle that everyone was subject to the law, even the king, guaranteeing the rights of individuals, the right to justice, and the right to a fair trial. 
Most of North Wales remained independently ruled by several Welsh princes, until 1216, when Llewellyn the Great became the ruler of the Principality of Wales. This would be the case until Edward I, who conquered Wales in 1284, effectively becoming part of England. At the death of King Alexander III, Scotland was left with 14 rivals for succession. To prevent civil war, the Scottish magnates asked Edward I of England to elect a claimant. John Balliol was elected king, but was constantly undermined by Edward, who opposed Scottish independence. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. If you bring in... This happened with Rome a lot, too. If you bring in the regional power to pick a successor or to decide on a dispute or something like that, it can help in that it can get you your successor or it can get the dispute you know, figured out, but then you've kind of given them a, a foothold and an air of legitimacy in the, in the area, in the province, in the country, whatever it is. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword there. Edward decided to launch several campaigns to conquer Scotland and depose King John, to which he acquired the nickname Hammer of the Scots. Under a brave Scottish knight, William Wallace, the Scots mounted resistance against the English, defeating them at, yeah, William Wallace. at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Edward marched north in person and defeated Wallace in battle, but Wallace managed to escape. He was later captured and executed, but his efforts allowed Robert the Bruce to rise up and defeat the English, securing Scottish independence. When the King of France died without an heir, Edward III was technically eligible to the crown, through his mother. The French court denied his claim and instead installed Philip of Valois. Edward paid homage to Philip as he owned the lands of Gascony, and was essentially a vassal to the King of France. Due to disagreements, Edward reasserted his claim to the throne and invaded France beginning the Hundred Years' War. The English achieved notable victories at the Battle of Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt thanks to the technical superiority of the longbow, but was unable to conquer the French with the appearance of Joan of Arc, who lifted the French spirit and turned the tide of the war. Upon the death of Edward III, an entire generation was skipped in the line of succession, which prompted bitter rivalry between several claimants. Most notably were the houses of... This is basically the, the history of you know, certainly of, of Europe, where you have just time after time after time when a monarch dies, there is this, in, in a lot of cases, multinational kind of scramble for the throne because you have marriages that come from, from all over the place, from, from different countries and different areas. So like with Edward having the claim to France because, you know, you have uh, the bloodline coming from a, a French royal. It's, it's the same thing with almost any time a monarch dies, there's just this huge scramble. Um, and a lot of times a, a war will break out over it, which is, it's kind of crazy in the modern day, but super common at this time. York and Lancaster. Tensions were high until a bloody age of warfare roses. erupted between these two factions in the Wars of the Roses. It's so in-depth and complicated this period will likely become a video of its own. Yeah. The wars ended with the arrival of the Tudor dynasty. Henry VIII wanting a divorce split with the church creating his own Church of England. This ultimately led to a series of religious differences between future English monarchs. He was a good guy. In between his six wives and naval adventures, Henry gave Wales representation in Parliament, and created the Kingdom of Ireland, but realistically he only controlled an area known as the Pale. In addition, Henry's paranoia and suspicion amounted to tens of thousands of executions, including his friends and wives. And there are, some historians will argue that essentially he got a traumatic brain injury from his fall. And that that is what eventually led him kind of down this spiral that, that he ended up going down. But a, a big deal about, you know, him being where he was when he was is you have this initial, you have this initial pulling apart from the church. 
you know, he has his issues with the Pope, obviously. And so you have this initial kind of breach between England and the church. And then that goes on to play a role later on. During the 16th century, the largest and most powerful empire was Spain under King Philip II. England, under Elizabeth I, were helping Dutch rebels reject Spanish rule, and many English privateers were also intercepting Spanish silver on its journey back from the New World. This angered the Spanish king, and the final straw came when Elizabeth had Mary Queen of Scots executed, because she did not want Scotland falling under Catholicism. The Spanish Armada, consisting of 130 ships, was deployed to invade England. At the Battle of Gravelines, an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles before storms in the north of Scotland destroyed the remaining ships. In retaliation, the English led by Sir Francis Drake amassed their own armada to invade Spain, but this too became a failed endeavour. Born in this period, William Shakespeare became a renowned poet, playwright and actor who contributed yeah, I swear I know that name from somewhere. ...did significantly to English literature. When Queen Elizabeth of England died without an heir, her closest male relative was James VI of Scotland. James was elected as King of England and Scotland in a personal union, although the countries remained separate political entities. As the first monarch to rule the entire island of Great Britain, several assassination attempts were made by Catholic conspirators. One such assassination attempt was the gunpowder plot by Guy Fawkes, who tried to blow up Parliament. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. After a failed colony known as Roanoke, England established a successful colony known as Jamestown, which would eventually evolve into the 13 colonies. At first, expeditions to the New World were mainly driven by religious motives, which were predominantly to convert the natives to their faith. But colonies became more profitable, as demand for New World crops like tobacco and sugar increased. British ships also made a monopoly on the transportation of captive African slaves that crossed the Atlantic to the Americas. Millions of Africans were shipped in cramped, horrific conditions to work on brutal plantations in the Americas, and essentially became property to their masters. For 300 years, this practice continued in the British Empire until it was fully abolished in 1833, this period also saw a wave of plantations in Ireland, where Irish lands were confiscated and given to English and Scottish settlers. Tensions would rise between Charles I and Parliament. Following disagreements, conflicts between royal and parliamentary authority within England led to the English Civil War. The country became divided between parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads, and royalists, known as the Cavaliers. Under Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army, the parliamentarians defeated Charles and executed him for treason. Cromwell became Lord Protector and dissolved the monarchy, but shortly after his death, it was restored under Charles II. Charles II married Catherine of Braganza, and when she arrived from Portugal, she introduced the greatest beverage of all time. Tea. Tea had been used by China for centuries, but its arrival in the 17th century captured the is a big freaking deal. The arrival of tea is a big deal, and I know for the Brits on here, you all probably know, but I know if they're, you know, for the people from the US, you're probably like, wait, what? Tea? Yes, it is a big freaking deal. Also, they don't go into it in depth, and, and there's been, you know, stuff that he's kind of quickly kind of gone from, you know, he, he says what happens, but there's really no context given to a lot of this. Um, there is major trade with the, the colonies and you have the, the sugar and tobacco and, and that sort of stuff. There is a shift happening around this same time where the British Navy is becoming pretty dominant. They're moving into a different league here. Um, and so they do, they, they trade and, and do everything economically. It's, it's everything they do participate, you know, are involved in, uh, the slave trade, obviously to the colonies and to a, a lot of other places for context, they are not, it made it seem a little bit like they were the ones that were doing it and and kind of only them they were not the only ones doing it and i'll see if he gets into it later but 
Britain reverses course on that. Obviously, it's it's a long time later, but they reverse course on that in a pretty drastic way later on. The interest of the English aristocracy, and soon captivated every other Englishman. In 1685, a Catholic James II became king in a largely Protestant nation. James's daughter Mary and her Dutch husband William were both Protestant, and many nobles unhappy with the Catholic king invited William to become king. William found considerable support when he invaded, and he was soon crowned King William III in what became known as the Glorious Revolution. Although William's supporters dominated the government, there remained a significant following for James II in the Scottish Highlands. Clan MacDonald of Glencoe was one such group who had not been prompt in pledging allegiance to the new monarch. For this reason alone, 38 members of the clan were murdered in what became known as the Massacre of Glencoe. After Scotland's failed colonial endeavours in Nova Scotia and Panama, and an economic crisis in the 1690s, there was a union between England and Scotland, forming the United Kingdom of Great Britain. The House of Stuarts had ruled Britain for just over a century, but ended with the death of Queen Anne. Sophia of Hanover was the granddaughter of James I, and her son George became king. Great Britain soon found itself drawn into several European wars most notable being the War of the Spanish Succession and the Seven Years' War. Victories in these wars resulted in territory for the empire, particularly in North America, although it resulted in considerable debt. Yeah, so that's the trade for the Seven Years' War. That's the trade that Britain makes. Um, I'm not entirely sure they would have made that trade going into it if they knew how much it was going to cost, but... That's essentially what they do. They trade money for a lot of territory, and they do get a lot of territory. But they, you know, they're in debt. Um, they're looking for ways to find money coming out of it. They, they have just been in this almost decade-long conflict, and they have new territory, but they have a, a you know, they, they need money. In order to make up for this debt, King George III ordered heavy taxes be placed on the 13 colonies. This, among other reasons, culminated into the American War of Independence, and with financial help from France and Spain, the Americans were victorious. The East India Company, which was founded by Elizabeth I, had grown rapidly, and even operated its own military and controlled a sizable amount of territory. The company had set up fortified warehouses where they traded with many India rulers, acquiring important luxuries like textiles and spices. One of the most important cities of all was Bengal, as it had a large taxable population. The governor of Bengal, Robert Clive, ordered that the population grow opium to export to China, instead of growing food as it proved to be a great source of income. Okay, so, the just a little side note, the thing down there said, uh... Bengal is a region, not a city. The narrator doesn't get paid enough to re-record this, so he had put that down at the bottom in case you guys didn't see it. Um, yeah, it's um, the the Chinese have a a system in which they trade, you know, through um, and and trade with other countries that nobody really likes, especially the British, and so it's going to cause some some major problems. Opium is going to be the way that Britain sees that they can offset this, this trade deficit over, over tea, which is why I said earlier, tea actually becomes a, a pretty big deal. However, when a famine struck, it resulted in the deaths of millions of people. Meanwhile, Captain James Cook arrived at New Zealand and the southeast coast of Australia. Although he wasn't the first to discover the area because of past Portuguese and Dutch explorers. However, unlike the Dutch and Portuguese, Britain claimed it as their new penal colony, known as New South Wales, with the first convicts arriving in 1778. A new threat had emerged from France, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> Napoleon had come to dominate most of Europe, but Britain's advantage was that she was an island, and the Royal Navy had become a major force at sea. 
Invasion of Britain was near impossible, and in a series of coalitions, Napoleon was defeated. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain was growing rapidly into a superpower based on their supremacy of naval engineering. Furthermore, in Ireland, the Great Famine struck. A disease killing potato plants. Ireland, which had merged with Britain, relied heavily on this crop for food. But the British government forced Ireland to export what little food they had to other areas. Without any aid or food, Ireland's population plummeted by half due to starvation and emigration to countries like the United States. Yeah, there's a huge wave of Irish immigration at that time to, to the US. Things weren't looking so great in India either, as India was rebelling against company rule. The East India Company had employed many Indian soldiers known as Sepoys, who were under the command of British soldiers. These Sepoys grew increasingly unhappy, and a revolt soon occurred, yet it quickly failed due to a lack of unity between Indians. After the rebellion, the British government took direct control, with Queen Victoria being declared Empress of India. During the 19th century, the world was forever changed by the Industrial Revolution. Society was transformed by technological advances and increasing mechanisation, and would launch Britain to global dominance. Some of the greatest innovations and inventions were the sewing machine, the fire extinguisher, steam-powered engines and turbines, the electric motor and photography. The telegraph was also a major invention, as a message could now be sent from Britain to India in a matter of hours. The establishment of railways and trains also transformed transport forever. Instead of travelling days by horse and carriage, it now only took a matter of hours by train. Engineering and communication advances not only united the empire, they triggered a manufacturing boom like no other. People flocked from rural areas to city centres for jobs. Productivity reached an all-time high, but the consequences of mass migration resulted in extremely cramped and polluted cities. This isn't... This isn't a problem that specifically Britain is dealing with, though. Um, yes, they are They are really pushing the envelope as far as technological advancements. But this uh, centralization of people flocking to cities, um, there are, it, you know, there were unintended consequences of the manufacturing of the industrialization that the places that did it quickly really had to deal with. You know, one of the things was massive pushback from the workers because you have a lot of these workers that are coming from rural areas to the cities to work in these, you know, manufacturing jobs. Um, they get in there, the conditions are, are harsh, and it starts this kind of, it starts this kind of loop of of workers not really feeling um, appreciated or compensated or you know and and so all over the place you have a lot of issues spring up that are not specific to Britain they are specific to industrialization and in fact it's so prominent that the Russians looking on are like well yeah we're not we're not doing that industrialization thing because then the the people go all crazy and you know they they start protesting or rioting and they start wanting you know more of this and more of that so we're just going to skip industrialization altogether however with these problems that were generated it resulted in an improved sewage system newcastle focused on shipbuilding manchester the cotton industry Liverpool became a major trading centre, Middlesbrough fixated itself on iron and steel works, the presence of iron ore, limestone and large coal deposits in the West Midlands and South East Wales prompted the establishment of ironworks, and Scotland boomed in the linen industry. The Victorian era also saw a major change in society, as families from the poorest backgrounds gained access to education, although it was much stricter than today's standards. The 1860s also saw the rise of the greatest food combination ever, fish and chips. <laughs> Towards the end of the 19th century, European powers came together at the Berlin Conference to divide Africa between them. A group in South Africa known as the Boers, who were originally Dutch settlers, proved difficult for the British. The Boers lived in two nations, the Free Orange States and the Republic of Transvaal. 
and both resisted British rule using guerrilla warfare. To counter this, the British placed many women and children in their tens of thousands into concentration camps, where many died from starvation and disease. Britain became a major player in the First World War, and many men proudly volunteered to serve and protect their country. The Great War, as it was called, saw the use of new technology, such as dreadnoughts, warplanes, artillery, machine guns, grenades, chemical weapons, bolt-action rifles, and the first use of the tank. I've talked about this before. Obviously, we've done a handful of World War I videos on the channel. But that boom in industrialization, that push forward in technology, leads to where countries are... They, they basically have all of this new stuff, all of this these new things to fight a war with. And everybody's kind of looking at everybody else like, you know, we, we could be extremely dominant in the next era of warfare because we have all this new stuff. Because our, uh, you know, we can shell better or uh, we have better grenades or rifles or whatever the technological advancement is. Um, they're better at it, right? And you have the uh, submarines coming in and you have the lighter than air aircraft with the blimps and stuff that really didn't do a ton, but were, were scary at the time. Um, and so that's why World War I is, if not my favorite, one of my favorite historical things to study, it's because of the rapid transformation of technology and all of this new stuff that gets brought together in this one huge clash um, where everybody is trying these new, uh, not only new weapons and, and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, but you have to have new tactics. Cavalry is basically just totally wiped away because they'll be slaughtered if you, if you try a cavalry charge. There's just all of these new things um, that, that everybody has to kind of learn on the fly in World War I. And it makes it a very interesting topic to study for me. Many faced horrific conditions in the trenches and witnessed gruesome battles. Millions died and many returned home shell-shocked by what they had seen. God. The Empire reached its territorial height in 1921 after gaining territory from Germany and the crumbling Ottoman Empire. The Empire now ruled over 400 million people and controlled one quarter of the world's landmass. But the reality Damn. was, Britain could no longer afford to build bases or ships to defend its empire as it had before 1914. Ireland finally managed to break away from British rule and formed the Irish Free State, and shortly after became a republic. The Second World War was more brutal and horrific than the first. Most of Europe had fallen under German occupation, and under Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Britain stood strong during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. Britain were extremely successful at intercepting and decoding enemy communications, with the likes of Alan Turing who cracked the German Enigma code. The war ended with an allied victory but many nations within the empire felt a desire for independence and it was clear the empire was about to break. India was one such nation who were ready to declare their independence. Mohandas Gandhi practiced a non-violent approach and this proved successful as shortly after India gained independence. The Commonwealth of Nations was formed to improve relations and economic ties with former colonies. This still remains today with 53 members united by language, history, culture and shared values of democracy. The British Empire officially ended with Hong Kong, Britain's last colony, being handed over to China in 1997. The Empire committed many atrocities on many different people, imposing their culture and civilization while often wiping out native ones. On the other hand, this brought about globalization and the uniting of the modern world. And without such innovations and industrialization, the world might have been a very different place. The United Kingdom suffered a small economic recession in 2008, but has since recovered. It is a multicultural society with each. Was it a small economic recession in 2008 for, for Britain or for the UK as a whole? I'm not sure. I haven't studied it quite as much from the British perspective, so I don't know. Um, obviously, here, here you had a lot of different stuff happen. You had the Federal Reserve start buying 
essentially bad assets from from these failing banks. You had them start quantitative easing, which was uh, shooting liquidity, you know, by by the by, by the cannon load into the financial sector. But the housing market continued to go down for years after two thousand and eight. So I'm I'm curious what how was that in Britain? Region retaining a presence of its history and culture. If you ever visit, look out for the Welsh cake, the haggis, the whiskey, the Chelsea bun, the parmo, the Cumberland sausage, the Yorkshire pudding, or the Cornish pasty. The UK remains a member of NATO, United Nations, and the World Trade Organization, and uses the pound currency. In 2016, a referendum resulted in 51.9% of voters in favour to leave the European Union. Although the countries within the United Kingdom became divided on the matter, leading to the many questions of its future unity. Thank you for watching. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, support us on Patreon. Have a good one. Okay, so that was the history of Britain in 20 minutes. Um, really interesting. Obviously that was quick, um, and it went through stuff really quickly, but yeah, I feel like that was, that was a good video. That was pretty well done. Obviously, um, Britain is probably the closest ally that the U S has today, which is a little bit interesting considering the, the history of the U S and founding of the U S and all that. But yeah, they've been they've been the closest U.S. ally for for quite a while now. So um, I know a I know a decent amount of British history, but honestly, it's more it's more from the perspective of like general European history and not specifically Britain. So I'm trying to learn more of specifically British history and. Uh, doing some more British stuff on the channel. So as always, if you like the content, want to support the channel, like, comment, subscribe. The Discord will be in the description box down below, and I will see you all next time.